Welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show, your resource for bone health, hormone optimization, and women's health through midlife and beyond. Today, I'm really excited to have Morley Robbins back on the show. Uh, we did a uh, an interview, uh, which be a a couple of weeks ago, um, they're going to be probably a few months between when they're posted, but a couple of weeks ago where we talked a lot about copper and iron and iron toxicity, and, and it got some really interesting feedback. So I wanted to bring him back on because there are so many topics that he brings up in his book. And if you haven't read his book uh, called Cure Your Fatigue, it's a really good look at uh, what's called the root cause protocol, copper, copper's role in this whole situation. And he brings up some really controversial points but backs everything up with a, a tremendous amount of evidence. And so uh, today we get into vitamin C, sort of the challenges around the idea that ascorbic acid is not vitamin C and it might not act like vitamin C in the body. We talk a little bit more about copper, about the, the thought behind copper toxicity and some of the feedback that I got uh, from this uh, first interview. And then we talk about vitamin A, the difference between beta carotene, retinol, retinoic acid, all of the different versions of vitamin A, uh, and the impact that vitamin A can have on the body, but how we might be fooled by the thought of uh, getting vitamin A through beta carotene and how much beta carotene it would really take. So stick around for this interview. Uh, I kept it short. We're about 40 minutes long, so I'm excited about that. Uh, these are topics that could go on for hours. So we did it in a pretty succinct way. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. All right. Well, welcome back, Morley. Um, super happy to have you back on uh, what we'll call uh, number two of hopefully is a three-part series talking about all of these really fun concepts that you talk about in your book. Uh, for those that haven't listened to the first episode of this, uh, we really got into iron toxicity and we talked a lot about copper. We're going to touch back a little bit on copper today. I want to get into some of the other topics that have come up a lot with my own team also in questions on um, on YouTube and social media, et cetera. So we're going to talk mostly today, we're going to talk about vitamin C, some, some myths, some realities, same thing about vitamin A, and we're going to touch back again on copper just a little bit. So Morley, really happy to have you back on to help us wade through some of this information. Yeah, great to be here. Delighted. And there's a lot of uh, myth information out there as we'll work our way through. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. So I guess actually let's start backwards. Let's hit copper again. And, and in our last episode, we talked a lot about copper and how it works with iron. And I would really encourage people to listen to that. We tried to put it together in a succinct way. Um, but some of the feedback I've gotten from my team is uh, if we're adding more copper, you know, they're very much worried about zinc. Uh, they're worried about copper toxicity. And we're trained as medical providers to watch out for copper toxicity. And, and I think this comes from you know, there are some genetic diseases and inborn errors of metabolism where copper toxicity is real. Um, and so it is something that people do have to worry about. But those are very unique situations and not what we, in my opinion, should be seeing if we're adding adequate amounts of copper back into the diet, either through food or supplementation. So let's hit the first part of that, which is we're taught, even in the functional medicine space, copper and zinc will uh, bind to each other and knock each other out of circulation if you consume them together, or if you consume one without the other. Can you give us a, a little bit of background on what you've learned with all the providers that are providing copper and potentially not necessarily zinc, uh, and how you see that working out? Well, ideally, we want to we have a balanced diet, an ancestral diet. We're going to get a lot of uh, minerals throughout that that. Uh, profile. What's undeniable is the loss of copper in our diet. And we are being drowned in zinc. I mean, it's, it's zinc is everywhere in the supplements, in the food, what have you. And tremendous amount of confusion about this. And, but the confusion didn't start until the 1960s, at the work of Carl Pfeiffer. And you got to go back to the source. You got to go find what was the article that he wrote that started this process of uh, potential copper toxicity. He was writing about ceruloplasmin in the late 60s, uh, further uh, written about in his book, Mental and Elemental Nutrients. It's about that thick. You'd, you'd love it. But um, he talked about... Uh, when ceruloplasmin gets breached, the copper becomes unbound from its 
transport protein. It's very specific about the language. Well, you know the game of telephone. You start to tell the story, and suddenly the, the, the ending, by the time you get around the circle, is very different. And so unbound from ceruloplasmin became unbound copper, became toxic copper, became copper toxicity. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, verbiage out there. Most of it's on the Internet, not, not so much in the uh, literature. And, you know, they're, they're trying to blame uh, heart disease on copper toxicity. They're trying to blame cancer on copper toxicity. I mean, it's, there's no end of, of the efforts that they'll go to. But the, the idea that copper and zinc are supposed to be in balance was never discussed by the great researchers back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. This didn't surface until the 1960s with Carl Pfeiffer. You know, um, Otto Werber, he wasn't worried about zinc. Um, Conrad Elvian, uh, even Hans Krebs, no one talked about zinc. It wasn't even in the literature back then. And and now, oh, every, everyone worries about the zinc copper ratio. <laughs> like we can't talk about superoxide dismutase without saying, oh, the, the copper, the zinc copper SOD. It's always got to get the zinc in first. Uh, and again, it's part of the, the brainwashing, in my humble opinion. And um, people don't know what zinc does to copper. It's, it's very... Um, George Brewer at the University of Michigan, do you know him? He's an MD who studied uh, Wilson's disease, which you were alert, alluding to, right. all the, the toxicity of copper because of, of the gene defect, AP, ATP7B, was actually... A, it's a retinol problem. It's not a... Co I mean, does copper build up? Of course it does. But where's the defect? It's in retinol, uh -huh. not in copper. And and so George Burroughs studied this for 15 years at Michigan. He had funding for 15 years. That's a long time. And he was studying how zinc blocked copper uptake. So we don't get Wilson's disease. It's like, come on now. And, um, and it's very effective at preventing copper uptake. Zinc will, in fact, guarantee that copper does not get into CTR1, that it cannot be absorbed in the enterocyte. There's another thing that zinc does. Um, you've probably have heard of amyloid plaque mm -hmm. and the amyloid precursor protein. Right. Well, the function of the APP peptide is ferrooxidase. It, it's a copper-dependent enzyme that runs APP, principally in the brain, well, what knocks out the ferrooxidase enzyme function? Zinc. Interesting. Ashley Bush, uh, down at University of Minnesota or University of Melbourne, figured that out back in 2010, uh, and his colleague Dr. Deuce, D-U-C-E. And then we have the third uh, problem is uh, complex four of the mitochondria. It's where the action is. Oxygen right. becomes water <clears throat> to release the ADP. Well, guess what zinc does? Zinc inhibits complex four. So I have, again, you're talking to a guy who is protecting the bioavailability of copper wherever possible. And when I read in the literature, just those three events, mm -hmm. I begin to question, I question, <clears throat> is this in our best interest? And the challenge we've got is that practitioners know what they know, but they don't know what they don't know. Sure. And and they don't they don't ask enough questions for my liking. And I I think what I began to do, Doug, is begin to question the narrative long ago. And when I got the twenty six errors in the narrative, then I flipped the narrative and said, the whole thing is wrong. What's right? Yeah. And people haven't taken the time to do that. Now, does that mean that I'm absolutely certain and, and I have no doubt about my position? No. But I, I've seen 
so much benefit by challenging the official narrative of nutrition and medicine yeah. that, that if I, I don't have confidence that we need more zinc. I don't have confidence that we need more ascorbic acid, which I know we're going to talk about. Yeah. And I don't have confidence in vitamin D because I know those three to be a triad to destroy the bioavailability of copper. And I'm here to protect copper. That's my that's my baby. It's your, it's your mission. And I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So so here's where I, I settled with my team is um you know, because we're adding copper for people where we see it needs to be added and we're looking at iron like we talked about last time. And um and my team threw up red flags and said, We are gonna deplete everybody's zinc. And I said, Okay, well the good news is is that we measure zinc. So we measure red blood cell zinc. Um, we can get a sense of what's happening with zinc levels in the body. I can tell you so far, I don't see it. Um, but we're going to do it cautiously at their, at their, and it's reasonable concern. That's what they're trained in. And that's fine. So we, we are, you know, we're collecting these data. I have not seen a depletion in zinc and we're not repleting zinc in most people. What I saw, especially over the last three years, everybody started taking more and more zinc, big doses of zinc during the pandemic. Right. Um, and so I, maybe we're just seeing a, a flood of, uh, red blood cell zinc. I don't know. Um, but we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But I wanted to ask you this too about, about copper and copper toxicity is that um, I have people that are concerned because of course they, they get our recommendations, they go online and I have wonderful patients that do a, t a tremendous amount of research. So I, it's fantastic, I love that. But when so much of the information is leading in the same direction, which is in contradiction to what we're saying, it can make some people uncomfortable. So um, I, <laughs> I have not seen anybody that has any signs of copper toxicity and we're using doses similar. I think we're using smaller doses than what you, uh, and the, the people in your circle are using. We, right. we will be anywhere from kind of one up towards to, to six or seven as a maximum dose of milligrams. Um, I'm not seeing any, but can you give us a sense of the providers that you're talking to, what kind of dosing they're using? Um, even talk, you know, talk about the supplement that you helped to create. You know, what kind of dosing is that? And are you seeing any kinds of signs of, of copper toxicity in people that are using it? Four, four to six milligrams is where people seem to be finding the sweet spot. So that's just when you recuperate. Um, again, with, when you go back into the literature, uh, the, the average American uh, intake of copper back in the 30s was four to six milligrams. In the 60s, it dropped two to five milligrams. And then now we're supposed to believe, again, what's the three-letter word in believe? And so we're supposed to believe that we need nine-tenths of one milligram. It's absolute insanity. People lost sight of the historical uh, reference point about copper intake. And the, and the real issue, this is my, this is my uh, perspective, Doug, is that um, copper is on this planet for many reasons— not the least of which is to keep iron mobilized. Now, what, yeah. what happened in 1972? Jacobs et al., uh, they're from Wales, Cardiff, Wales. They published a very important article in British Medical Journal saying, oh, we got to focus on the ferritin protein. Let's store iron. And up until that point, up until 1972, everyone knew that iron needed to be in circulation. Yeah. And what's really good at making iron in circulation? Copper. Copper. And what has happened since 1941, when they started adding iron filings to our food system, that's an established fact, increased to 50% in 1969, established fact, nine different forms of iron in our food system, established mm -hmm. fact, all nine cause cancer, established fact, is people have become iron toxic, but no one talks about that. Oh, everyone's anemic. And so then you, you drop in copper into the system. Guess what happens to the iron? It gets mobilized. What are two known symptoms of iron overload? Nausea, hmm. hyperactive mind. And guess what they did? They just moved the spotlight from iron over to copper and said, yeah, see, the copper's causing the problem. Copper's causing right. that nausea thing. Copper's causing that hyper racing mind. And it's like, come on, let's let's step back and think about this in a more historical context. And people need to take the long view about 
what the food was like when uh, Weston A. Price was studying things around the world. Right. The, the mineral composition of the soil, you, it's, not, it, it's published. You can go into the, into the annals of agricultural study to see what the mineral composition was in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and now look at it today. You know, make sure you're talking to uh, Don Huber when you have that conversation at, at Purdue University and find out the decimation of minerals because of glyphosate. And it's a very different perspective of putting those two mineral profiles side by side. It's Farmers should not even be able to recognize what's right. going on in their farming. We're living in a different world. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's that's a great transition point. So then let's let's work let's work our way into ascorbic acid. So you mentioned ascorbic acid will have a negative impact on um, on copper, on iron, um, and so for those that aren't familiar, you know, we when we look at vitamin C, particularly in supplementation, it almost always a supplement will say vitamin C has ascorbic acid, but there are a few products, not many. But there are a few products out there that will say vitamin C as a whole food source of vitamin C, and then there's a couple of different things that it could be. What's the difference between those two, and, and how do they function differently? How much sudden yet? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the way I describe it is um, think of whole food vitamin C as your car that has an engine, a steering wheel, four wheels, and a cover. That's pretty much your car. Well, that's the whole food vitamin C as it was described by Royal Lee at Standard Process. Uh, okay. It's the vitamin C that you've heard of Albert Sengorgi, uh, who allegedly got the Nobel Prize for, quote, discovering the ascorbic acid. That's pure myth. <laughs> he got his his uh, Nobel for the the bioenergetics of the cell, <clears throat> and he and guess what he was studying? He was studying Hungarian peppers, <laughs> which are a very rich source of whole food vitamin C. He knew that. He was really studying hyaluronic acid. Mm. Hyaluronic acid is in charge of the wound repair system. Guess what hyaluronic acid has inside it? Copper, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Guess what hyaluronic sounds like? Hexuronic. Hexuronic acid is another way of saying ascorbic acid. So there's a lot of confusion. And now the, the letter that you may not know about, or that your, your team may not know about, uh, Sun Gorgi gets his Nobel in December of 1937. Yeah. In July... July 4th, 1936, 18 months before he gets the nod, he writes a letter to the editor at Nature Journal. That's a big, that's a big publication. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a heady thing. I've, I've read the article many, many times, just a one-pager. But in the article, he very clearly states, and I quote, ascorbic acid does not cure scurvy. Food. He puts that in writing, in the letter. And so, I don't know. Does he know what he's talking about? And what he really talked about in the letter is that it was the permeability factor, vitamin K, he called it, that was in fact principal for, for curing scurvy. Well, we know that today as rutin. We know that today as quercetin. Mm. So it's, again, we're, we're getting into areas of uh, biochemistry and nutrition that most people don't know about. And I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff until I started scratching the surface. And so the, the vexing um, questions that people raise is, yeah, but, but ascorbic acid cures cancer. Ascorbic acid prevented me from getting COVID, right? Right, right. And, and what people don't realize is that as it relates to cancer, what does high-dose ascorbic acid do? It creates a hydrogen peroxide storm. And the goal is to kill the cancer cells. And a lot of hydrogen peroxide will do that. 
but but I take a slightly different stance, and that and I I don't pretend to to be everyone's darling, because uh, I'm I'm trying to understand why these things work or what what they're doing, and so cancer is a metabolic state, and so think of cancer as adolescents taking drugs, <laughs> right? And yeah. and there are there's a certain subset of the adolescent community that does drugs. What we're supposed to believe if we're oncologists is we need to shoot those adolescents and kill them, get rid of them. Is that what society does? No, it rehabilitates them. And I take the stance that what's missing in cancer metabolism is the ability to metabolize oxygen, because oxygen is present. We have the Warburg effect. And what's what's really MIA? Bioavailable copper. <clears throat> what's the what's the cancer cell ravenous for? Iron and sugar. It's going back to an earlier life form. The metabolic wow. state of cancer is an earlier life form. And so oncologists are trained to kill cancer cells. One of my clients years ago was a very high-profile uh, oncologist with a lab at NIH. And I did work for him, and then over time I realized I couldn't work for him anymore. And he challenged me on it. He said, why, why won't you work for me? And I said, because you're killing people. And he said, Morley, hold that thought. I'll call you in 24 hours. So I thought, sure, can't wait to find the, get this call. So he called me back in 24 hours, and this is what he said, and I quote, I was expecting him to say, Worley, you're a son of a bitch. Worley, you don't know what you're talking about. Worley, I'm whatever. This is what he said. Morley, I will miss you. And that was an admission of guilt, as far as I'm concerned. So there's a lot of confusion around uh, ascorbic acid. And what is important for people to understand is that the founders, or the people who, quote unquote, discovered ceruloplasmin, before Mother Nature, uh, were Holmberg and Laurel. They wrote a very important article in 1948 about it. And in that article, they were very specific about how ascorbic acid blows up the ceruloplasmin protein to create unbound copper. And what does it get bound to? Albumin. There is no unbound copper in the human body. It doesn't even exist. It's always... It's always bound to something. It's either going to be albumin, histidine, or transcuprine, a transport protein that's just like transferrin. And inside the cell, turn to the research of Svetlana Lutsenko, who studied in Hopkins, and what do we discover? That it's 0.2101 is the amount of unbound copper. And so this idea that copper is toxic is just lunacy on steroids, and the ascorbic acid uh, narrative is just that. And it's, it's been twisted to such a state that um, the idea that, well, let me back, back up. So you're familiar with the triopathy of diabetes, retinopathy, yes. neuropathy, and nephropathy, right? Right. Those three tissues can't process the sugar. Do you know why they can't process the sugar? It's because huh. they, they're insulin independent. They don't rely on insulin. Mm. It's a completely different, completely different pathway that's used, and it involves a transition between vitamin C and glucose. And there's a critical <laughs> enzyme that needs to be regulating that exchange. And the, the enzyme is called ascorbate oxidase. As soon as you hear the word oxidase, you know oxygen is involved. You know that copper is going to be nearby. And in fact, what happens is as the sugars build up in the tissue, the glucose becomes sorbitol. Sorbitol is blowing up the ceruloplasmin, chelating the copper. The ascorbate oxidase cannot work. And guess what? Guess what fructose and, and glucose do to the tissue? Oxidize it, burn it up, 
And that's what happens with the triopathy of diabetes. And it's all about a mineral breakdown. And people would say, oh, well, ascorbic acid must be just as good as ascorbate oxidase. No, ascorbate is, ascorbic acid is the anti, it's, the, it's actually a prooxidant, or no, it's an antioxidant shell that has no enzymatic function in the body mm. from that standpoint. Got it. So nothing good, <clears throat> some bad, and yet we take it in big doses when we don't feel well, which is probably not helping us. I don't think it does. I, yeah. Again, I, th I think the, um, and in that case of, and I used to do that, Doug, years ago, before I did any of this work, I used to do that. You know, whatever the uh, little packets of vitamin C that you used mm -hmm. to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aller allergen C or whatever it was. I mean, I did that. And again, it's, and I used to, I used to take zinc lozenges for heaven's sake for years. Yeah. I would take the, yeah. and it's just, for whatever reason, I had been invited into this inquiry to say, is there another perspective? Are we missing other points of view? And I, I think what's important is for people to keep, as you noted at the beginning of the conversation, we've got to keep an open mind. We've got to ask more questions about what are we doing yeah. here? And I think it's important for practitioners to go beyond their training and say, is there more than I was taught? Is there yeah. other, other secondary and tertiary uh, impacts that I'm not aware of? Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's tough to get around the ascorbic acid because it's in so many things. Absolutely. And a lot of times when people come into our office and we're you know we're doing a, a run through of what they're currently taking, and people are usually because I, I I love my population of patients, they are usually taking you know thirty different supplements, right. um, which is fun because we actually end up paring that down, like and say you know you need to take less. Um, but one of the things that's always on there is, you know, a thousand or 2000 or 5,000 milligrams of, of ascorbic acid. Absolutely. Um, yep. and so my, I've, I've, even before I started listening and, and read your book and listening to your, the podcast that you've been on in the past, um, I always felt like vitamin C was, it's easy to get through food. If you eat a, a diet that has fruits and vegetables in it, right. it is still in our food supply. So it's not one that needs to be, uh, supplemented probably at all, honestly. Hey, sorry to interrupt this interview with Morley, but I wanted to let you know that if you haven't already joined our masterclass either on osteoporosis or on hormone optimization and replacement for women, consider these free resources if you're interested in learning how we put together a bone health program, how we put together hormone optimization, how we do hormone replacement. Both of these masterclasses, again, are free. Take a look at the description below for the links to that. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to drdouglucas.com. You'll find the links on that website. Let's get access to the ferrooxidase enzyme assay, the colometric assay. Mm -hmm. it, it costs a whopping $4. See. And that would then tell us the distinction between ceruloplasmin, which will show up on a blood test, but we're going to get the height of it, but we're not going to get its IQ. You don't get its IQ until you measure the ferrooxidase assay. And then we will know what is all this ascorbic acid doing to affect the master antioxidant protein and its intelligence in our body? Until we have access to that assay, we're never going to resolve we don't it. Know. We're never going to yeah. resolve it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, so then the last thing I want to talk about today, because I am, we're going to keep this under an hour. We're going to do it morally. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is vitamin A. So vitamin A, I, I had already gone down this rabbit hole a little bit before I, I read your book. And when most people think of vitamin A, they think beta carotene, they think carrots, they think orange, orange vegetables, right? right. Um, and then I remember, um, you know, because I have read a lot of the literature around uh, carnivore diets and eating liver. Um, and there is, of course, fear. There's a lot of fear around vitamin A toxicity. So you have to sort of separate some of the big picture things here, which is plant-based vitamin A versus animal-based vitamin A, uh, you know, the beta carotenes of which there are several, and then different forms of retinol, uh, which can be very confusing for people. Um, but let's just dig into a little bit of vitamin A, and this is going to back into vitamin D a little bit, sure. which is fine. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the difference between the function of, say, beta carotene versus retinol and why retinol itself is so important. 
hands down, I think one of its most important functions is it activates the copper pumps, mm. ATP7A and ATP7B. And for the listeners, 7B is making plasma, very important uh, protein that has many enzyme functions. 7A is all the rest of the copper enzymes. And if people, so again, if you train people to be fearful of copper, why would I need to know about the copper enzymes? Well, the copper enzymes are, the, are what make our energy. The copper enzymes are what clear our exhaust. Copper enzymes are what color our body, both inside and out. You know, the, the, the placenta and the spleen are supposed to be very deep purple, very vibrant color. And if they don't have access to tyrosinase, melanin can't do its job to color the body. Um, yeah. nerve, nerve transmission doesn't work without. So the, the loading of copper to enable the vast activity of those enzymes doesn't happen unless there's retinol in the diet. I didn't know that. It's a, and, and I've seen that in one article, Barber and Cousins, 1987. And it's like, sometimes I wonder, how did they let that one article go through? It's, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. But, but the thing is, we have a, a cookbook from um, the Fanny Farmer cookbook that goes back a couple hundred years, goes back to Boston. And, and just to, to see what they were eating back in the early 1800s. And it was heavy cream. And, you know, you can imagine the eggs in those recipes were from yard eggs, of course. Right. Uh, butter, right? You know, grass-fed, of course. And organ meats. And so there were fake foods in that in that cookbook I'd never even heard of. But when you research them, you find out they're, they're based on organ meats. And so, um, again, we live in a different world. We live in a more refined world. The diet, our, our diet is completely refined from what our great-great-grandparents were eating. And right. that doesn't mean it's better. <laughs> yeah. It's just more refined. And so retinol um, needs to be metabolized. The, the word that you would use would be conjugate. And so chemical conjugation is like when we're, we're learning a language, we have to learn how to conjugate verbs. You know, what, what's the context for the word? Well, <clears throat> retinol becomes what are called retinoids. And we have... Um, nuclear receptors that are play a very critical role uh, inside uh, the nucleus to make sure that things like vitamin D actually work. But active vitamin D will not work without RxR. You don't. And, R and RxR is the nuclear receptor. And RxR is the nuclear receptor. Well, there's RARs, ROrs, RxRs, RzRs, and so these nuclear receptors are profoundly important, but how much of that is on the internet? None. There's no information about that. Then we have retinoic acids. There's at least four that we know of. All trans is sort of the, the workhorse, but uh, there's, there's nine cysts, 11 cysts, 13 cysts. And these are very, these are hormones, very powerful hormones that help run the body and how does all of this happen? When the sunlight kisses our body, it activates the breakdown of retinol. And we've all been conditioned to just look at vitamin D and not consider yeah. anything else. And so <clears throat> does sunlight stimulate the synthesis of vitamin D? We know it does. But it also stimulates the breakdown of retinol, which is absolutely essential. And what's the pivotal agent for both of those events? B9, folic acid. Oh, and what does folic acid have? Oh, yeah, it's a copper-dependent B vitamin. It doesn't work mm -hmm. without copper. And so <clears throat> this is not taught in practitioner school. You're taught about folic acid, not folate. 
I didn't know about folate until I was talking to Leslie Cleveland. Right. And so it's just, these are the hidden gems that people don't know about, that there's a binary uptake mechanism for A and D. And if you flood the body with D, you're not going to get A. And you have to step back and have you ever studied uh, embryology? Embryology? What, what are uh, the nutrients? Only what I was required to do in medical okay. school. Yeah. Right. But what are, they probably didn't get into the nutrients that are essential for proper brain formation, proper nervous system formation. And there's three that they'll talk about when you get into the, the nutrient side of it. Magnesium, copper, and retinol. Not beta carotene, retinol. Again, I know. There's, a, there's a potency to retinol in the animal-based form. So you have precursor and preformed. Precursor is beta carotene. Preformed is the animal's done the work for you. The, right. the, 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 the beauty of the cow, it, it takes, it takes the, the beta carotene in the grass and turns it into retinol in the tissue. Right. right. And there's a series of chemical reactions that take place that we can't do because we're not cows. But, right. but what's important is there's something called a retinol equivalency unit. Mm -hmm. One unit of beta carotene does not equal one unit of retinol. It's 12 units of beta carotene equals one unit of retinol. You can eat a bag of carrots <laughs> or you can take a spoonful of cod liver oil. And right. so there's an efficiency and, and a potency to retinol that's not found in beta carotene. The other point that I would make is that there's an, en there's an enzyme that in fact converts beta carotene into um, a more advanced form of, of retinol, right? And it's called beta carotene monooxygenase. What's the battery pack for BCMO? It's copper. I would, I would imagine oxygen and copper. copper. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a very deep relationship between our retinol and copper in our body that is not uh, carefully understood uh, in practitioner circles. And I, I, when you look at the, um, again, look at historical cookbooks, you're going to find a tremendous dependency on butter and the forms of retinol that our ancestors were very familiar with that have been engineered out because we have a more refined diet. And that doesn't mean that it's a more nutritious or more metabolically advanced diet. Yeah. I, I think what's really interesting about <clears throat> vitamin A when I started looking into it is I, somebody uh, gave me a paper on Vitamin A, of course, they were worried about vitamin A toxicity, and they said vitamin A uh, results in osteoporosis. Vitamin A causes osteoporosis. And I thought, well, that's weird. I don't know why that would happen. And so you look at the papers, and they look at consumption of vitamin A, and there is a U-shaped curve in association with, with vitamin A and, and osteoporosis. So both what that means for those that don't know what a U-shaped curve is, is that there's risk on both sides, both low and high. One of those things where maybe there's a sweet spot. And so we have, as doctors, we've been told watch out for vitamin A toxicity because everybody has access to polar bear liver and it's, you know, it's going to be in our diet, uh, which is literally it's on the, the, the medical board test, like every, every year, you know, somebody goes hunting in Alaska and eats the liver of the polar bear. Cause this happens a lot. Um, anyway. And so, so I started looking into this and I thought, okay, well, how much vitamin A would one have to eat to become vitamin A toxic? And that's when I learned for the first time about the retinol activity equivalents. Most of the other nutrients are listed in the, you know, the minimum threshold of whatever, the FD, the FDA, the whatever you want to call those things, which are for acute illness anyway, not for optimization, but they're listed in milligrams, micrograms, you know, some sort of measurement like that. Vitamin A is listed in RAE, right. retinol activity equivalents. Right. And so I had to, of course, like I've never heard of an RAE. So you go back and look and essentially what they're saying is, there is no amount of beta carotene that we can say will be adequate because there is there are two issues to get it from beta carotene into retinol in the body is that you have to absorb it and then you have to convert it. Right. And like you just said, Morley, we are not 
we are we are not cows. We don't convert it well, right. and it's going to be different from person to person. And then the absorption is going to be different from person to person. So there's no way to know: is it one bag of carrots or is it ten bag of carrots to get to what is it will be an opt, an optimal amount of RAE. And so that's why I started looking at for my patients and I said, look, we're not going to focus on plant sources of, of beta carotene. They're irrelevant for us at this point. What we want to know is how much RAE and honestly, let's just give you retinol, right? So let's use cod liver oil. And so that's when we started adding CLO in. Um, and we are now measuring retinol in blood as well. Right. Um, so we don't have, we don't have enough data to know now is, are we impacting it positively because we're also impacting vitamin D, which we're going to talk about later. But I think it's interesting when you look at recommendations about beta carotene, the the papers will say just eat beta carotene because it's going to be safer. You don't have to worry about toxicity and you'll convert what you need and get rid of the rest. And I think they, there's no, there no evidence to say that that's true. They're just okay. leaning on this idea that, well, plants are safe, so that must be fine. Well, the, what I've come to realize is that when the when the the winds of a recommendation tell me that there's copper toxicity and retinol toxicity, I know enough to to question that. And the the thing that's important is for people to re I I had a client who actually was from Germany. He presented with uh, what what he said was retinol toxicity, vitamin A toxicity. Mm -hmm. So we got into into his blood work and into his. I, I do what I, I affectionately refer to as a stress mosaic. Find out what's, what's the pattern of stress in your life. And this guy was off the chart. Turns out, um, when, when all the dust settled, uh, he wasn't eating a really pristine diet. There was a lot of glyphosate in his diet. So mm -hmm. we're, suddenly we have a mineral dynamic that's very different under that condition. And when, when we've stripped away all of the, the verbiage from another practitioner, turned out he was iron toxic to the core, and the symptoms of iron toxicity are being blamed on retinol toxicity. We're back to the mm -hmm. same bait and switch that we had before. Oh, the, uh, the, the copper's causing my nausea, when in fact maybe it's the iron that's causing it, and now we're talking about iron's not being regulated properly because we live in a very... Uh, Cupro deficient world, and yep. and so now they're going to point at the retinol, and I really think that the the glyphosate issue is compromising the copper, which is affecting the metabolism of vitamin A in our body. That's where I think the the breakdown is. Yeah, yeah, and you you alluded to it a little bit earlier too about vitamin D and supplementation of vitamin D and through cholecalciferol is going to have an impact on on retinol levels as well even if you are consuming it, which is again, another reason to use cod liver oil because it's their low, a low amount of vitamin D is going to be found in cod liver oil right. and it's going to complement the vitamin A rather than overload it. Exactly. So, um, well, Morley, I think we actually did it in a very reasonable amount of time. We covered three very big topics. I would like to congratulate both of us. Um, <laughs> any, uh, parting words for the audience on this? And, and I will just say it so that I know it's going to happen is that our next conversation is going to be about vitamin D. So we'll, we'll talk, we'll dig into the, the deception as it were. And, um, but anything, uh, any parting thoughts for the audience on these, these three topics? Um, I, th I think it's important for people to appreciate that there's more to the story and that there's a lot of opinion on the internet, uh, and I think what we have to do is take the time to, to dig a little bit and see, is there another perspective that I don't know about? Are there are there nutrient factors that I've never been, really been trained in, like enzyme functions that are in play that might be influencing the narrative that I'm being, being trained in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's great, and we should always be asking questions, and we should always be learning um, and I keep finding over and over again that the truth is generally going to be in the minority. Um, so we keep we keep digging and learning and uh, applying things that make sense to apply. And, and your work has been really helpful for that, Morley. So I appreciate that. All right. Great job making it to the end of that video. These topics are very challenging to do in a uh, short, succinct way. So I hope you found that really helpful. 
Um, if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments on YouTube and uh, myself and my team will get through all of those. Uh, if you have already listened to one of our master classes, I would encourage you, if you need more information, to consider looking at our HealthSpan Nation or Bone Foundations course specifically for osteoporosis. Uh, you can find out more information on both of those uh, products at uh, drduglucas.com. Uh, great resources at low cost uh, to get to you information that you need. And that is it. So my friends, remember that you are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Don't be afraid to be extraordinary because you are, and that's what it takes. I'll see you next time.